Malachi. Malachi. This is the uh, fitting as it's the last book of the Old Testament, last book of our series on the minor prophets. Again, minor because of their length, not minor because of their impact. Uh, After this book, there's 400 years of silence before another prophet comes on the scene. And this book will actually talk about that other prophet. And that other prophet's name is John the Baptist, right? So there's 400 years of silence. Somebody earlier tonight asked me, well, what happened during those years of silence? And that's what a lot of the apocryphal writings address. And I would commend those to you with a very large neon sign caveat. And that is, they are not scripture. Uh, They are not inspired. Uh, They are not authoritative over our lives. However, there is included in the Apocrypha, especially, and I, I really would recommend the book of, of Maccabees to you if you're curious about what's going on during this time. There's historical content contained within, but outside of that, we believe as far as the inspirational uh, writings that we can say these are inerrant and authoritative. The word of God, it ends with Malachi and it picks back up with uh, Matthew. Who was Malachi? Well, as we have grown accustomed to do, we uh, like to turn on the clicker. There, uh, this is Malachi, according to different people. We've got Mormon Malachi on the left. That's the, uh, the Mormon Malachi. He looks like uh, somebody that you might run into here in Orange County with a white uh, hoodie on, and that's him. In the middle, this, I call this guy Hungry Malachi because he's very gaunt, and if you can see his arms, they're not doing too well. And then I've got Castaway Malachi up in the upper right because it, it looks like Tom Hanks uh, could have jumped in and, and played Malachi in the movie. Again, we have no idea what Malachi looked like. But he was writing during a time in Israel, as we'll see, where uh, things are not going well. The priesthood has become corrupt. The worship of the people had grown cold and routine. Uh, Marriage was under attack through intermarriage with foreign women and and the the swearing allegiance to even foreign gods and bringing that into the, uh, the worship structure there. But also marriage was under attack through divorce as well. Uh, Beyond this, you had the the idea of social justice, meaning uh, divorce that from its its loaded context in our culture and our society today. But uh, just in in a general term, the the care for the widows and the orphans and the needy and the the oppressed, as the Israelites were called to care for them, those things were being neglected and, and wicked was winning the day and ruling the day, which even led Malachi to say, God, what's the, or not Malachi, but the people to say, what's the point of following God? when the wicked seem to be doing better than, than the righteous are doing at this point. Beyond that, you had tithing was neglected. And this was the environment into which Malachi spoke and prophesied. What else do we know? Well, we know Malachi means my messenger. That's what his name literally means. There's not a lot known about the prophet. There's some that have argued that this is just a, a name that somebody else wrote uh, just anonymously under the name Malachi, my messenger. But there's Really no reason to believe that. Uh, None of the other minor prophets do we argue that. And and just because this has a generic meaning to to it and we don't know a lot about the guy's specific life doesn't mean that this wasn't written by a man whose name actually was Malachi. He was, as I mentioned, the last prophet of the Old Testament before John the Baptist came on the scene. There's 400 years of silence. We're taking off one month for men's Bible study. So just one month versus 400 years. Four weeks to 400 years. So we'll be back in September. The silence won't last Uh, that long, but he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He prophesied about a hundred years after Cyrus's decree from Ezra chapter one, verses two through four. And you'll remember in Ezra chapter one, verses two through four, Cyrus decrees that the exiles could return back to Jerusalem. And so the reason why we believe that is uh, is a a fewfold reason why uh, we get into the the dating on that. And I'm about to get into more of the, the reason why. Uh, the date that we believe is, is probably between 450 and 430 BC is when this was composed, when this was uh, addressed, when this was prophesied, 450 to 430 to BC. And you say, well, why? Uh, first, when we look internally at the book, there's a reference in chapter one, verse eight to the governor, which lets us know that Israel during this time, that Jerusalem during this time is still under Persian control. The Persians would rule until the middle of the fourth century BC, the middle of the 300s uh, BC there. And so because of that, we know that they're, they're still in Persian rule there. The second thing we know is the temple has been completed because Malachi is going to address the abuses that are taking place within the temple itself. So this had to have taken place sometime after 515 BC. That's when the temple was completed. The other thing that we know is that 
when we look at the, the conditions that Malachi was writing about, when he, we look at what was going on and what he was confronting, it's very similar uh, when we look at the moral conditions to what we find in the book of Ezra and in the book of Nehemiah. Ezra was written at about 458 BC, Nehemiah about 444 BC. So when we take all of those things into consideration, that's how we get that time frame, that span of about 450 to 430 BC. If somebody hard presses you on it and says, can we know for sure that's when it was written? Honestly, no, but this is our best guess and the evidence seems to support uh, a time frame between 450 and 430 BC for the book. What's the theme of Malachi? Well, it's a, a big book. There's a lot going on in four chapters here, but I think uh, the, the best thing after studying this, reading through it, uh, thinking about it, is that this is a book about warnings to those who have grown spiritually complacent. It's a book about warnings uh, for those that have, have grown comfortable, that no longer fear anything else happening to them, Assyria, Babylon, anything else. They, they feel like everything's copacetic between them and the Lord. And so they've grown spiritually complacent. And so the purpose then, why Malachi wrote, is to get better technology. He wrote to provide a, a wake-up call to these people, to those in the state of spiritual slumber, calling them to uh, repentance before it would be too late. And so as we get into uh, the book itself, the map, there's not really a lot going on outside of Jerusalem. This is written to the people of Judah. This is written to the Israelites, okay? So we're not dealing with foreign nations. We're not dealing with Assyria like we have been or Babylon or anything else. And so we're, we're really just dealing with Israel, with Judea, uh, specifically there and the people of the southern tribes of Israel. As you're thinking through the book, and maybe you guys want to, instead of trying to write all this down, if you want to take a picture of this slide after I get through the outline, it may save your, your hands a little bit. Or if you want this or, or uh, some of the other uh, presentations I've given in the past, just email me and I'll, I'll send it to you. But just in general, in the, the first few verses, we see God's election of Israel, his special love given towards Israel and not to the other nations. The second thing we see is the failure of the priests, the Israelite priests. And that's chapter one, verse six to chapter two, uh, verse nine there. The third thing we see is we see the faithlessness of the people of Israel, the, the, the people living in and around the the area of Jerusalem during that time. That's chapter two, verses 10 through 16. The next thing we see is the fallenness of the people, not just their faithfulness, but then also just their moral fallenness in chapter two, verse 17 through chapter four, verse three. And then the final thing that we see is the faithfulness of the Lord, the faithfulness of the Lord. So I'll leave that up there for just a second so that you can uh, grab a picture of the, the outline there. But that's basically what's going on here in the book of Malachi. And just by way of, of reminder to us, and hopefully this series has changed the way that you think about the minor prophets, that it's not all doom and gloom. And, and in fact, in, in all of them, we've seen some glimpses of the hope, some glimpses of looking forward to say, yes, but this is not the end. This is not all there is. It doesn't end with God wiping people off the face of the earth. It ends with there being a hopefulness there. Even as as sharp as an end as Jonah had, there's still a hope in that Nineveh responded to the call from the Lord to repent. And God issued a, 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 a reprieve against his judgment that he had promised against Nineveh. And so the, the minor prophets are, are not just doom and gloom and everybody's doing wrong and this is just destruction is coming, woe is me, sackcloth and ashes. There's hope in it as well. If you weren't here last week, and just to remind us of what Luther said about the minor prophets, they have a queer way of talking, like people who instead of proceeding in an orderly manner, like all men should, you can read the implications there into Luther's thought process, they ramble off from one thing to the next so that you cannot make head or tail of them or see what they're getting at. Now, Luther's probably had his conversations by this point in time and eternity with each of the minor prophets and gotten himself sorted out, but if you've been confused, Luther was confused as well. Well, let's get into the text of Malachi. Chapter one, verse one, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, my messenger. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom, says the offspring of, of 
Esau. If Edom, if the Edomites say, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of hosts says, they may build it, but I will tear it down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this. And you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. And so the book opens and Malachi has this way of anticipating the objection when God gives an indictment or when God gives a statement and indicative. And, and it opens by saying, you know, Israel, God has loved you. And the prophet anticipates or God anticipates Israel's objection saying, well, how have you loved us? Because in their uh, recent history, in their memory, they're remembering exile. They're remembering the destruction of the temple and they're remembering all of these things. And, and yet God responds to their perceived objection or their anticipated objection. And he goes all the way back to the beginning and he says, remember, remember Jacob and Esau. Jacob, I loved Esau, I what? Hated. And then he goes on there and he says, look, even now, if the Edomites were to rise up and they were to rebuild and they were to become a world power and, and flex their muscles and say, Israel, look at us, we're stronger than you are. God says, I would still go back to them and say, okay, you've built, but I'm going to tear you down yet again. Israel, know that the Lord is great. Know that the Lord loves you. And so it starts out with a, a positive note for Israel. And remember lest Israel get prideful and boastful, back in Deuteronomy chapter nine, what does God say to Israel about why he chose them? He says, it's not because you were any better than anyone else. It's not because you were more lovely, more attractive, more righteous, more holy than anyone else, more worthy than anyone else, that I chose you and formed you into a people, but I did so for my own name and for my own glory. And so what we have here is a reminder by the Lord of his power over other nations and his electing love of Israel. And it's a good way to, to start out this book because he's going to be calling Israel to remember God's love and affection for them and to respond appropriately throughout the pages of this prophecy as he's confronting the sinfulness of Israel. It's a good reminder for us as well as we get started. We're going to get right in. And point number one for us tonight is we need to remember the God who chose us. Remember the God who chose you. We'll get into this concept more in our small group time. And somebody actually already asked me about that tonight. Wow, you're going heavy with some of the small group questions on election and things. I said, yeah, I get to stir the pot and then leave and you guys get to sort it out. But we can't get around the text. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Deuteronomy 9 makes it abundantly clear that it was not Israel who chose God, but God who chose Israel. And then we get in, when we get into the book of Romans, Paul makes it abundantly clear that God has set his affection on us far before we set our affection on him. Romans 5, while we were yet ungodly, weak, sinful enemies of God, he died for us. And then we get beyond that, Romans 8, and you, you get into the foreknowledge and the predestination and, and you get into the glorification, which hasn't yet taken place, but it's as sure as done because it's, it's tied to Christ. And if we still don't like these words, we get into Romans 9, 10, and 11, where Paul really lays the hammer down and he starts to talk about the clay and the potter. And he starts to talk about how the clay has no right to look at the potter and say, how dare you make one vessel for dishonorable use and another vessel for honorable use. And so it's an uncomfortable doctrine, perhaps, but I would hope for those of us who are in this room who are followers of Christ, we're humble enough to admit this morning, tonight, not this morning, but we should also admit it this morning and tonight and tomorrow morning, that we were not, we didn't earn God's affection. We didn't earn our salvation. We didn't begin that process. But it was God who set his affection on us, regenerated us, made us new creations in Christ, gave us the faith to believe and to repent from our sins and to follow Christ. And that's something that we've got to remain anchored to. And that has to be our foundation. That's something that Israel had forgotten in this book. There's that old line that goes, what? Dance with what? The date that brought you. Dance with the date that brought you. Well, Israel was no longer dancing with the Lord. And the Lord had brought them. The Lord had selected them and called them out and chosen them and formed them and preserved them and delivered them from slavery and brought them into the promised land and was 
patient with them as they were rebelling during the time of the kings and warned them during the times of the kings and then sent them into exile. And as we've seen in the other books that we've looked at, still, even as we looked at last week in Micah, preserved a remnant while they were in exile and did not wipe them out and was faithful to bring them back to Jerusalem after exile, faithful to see the temple rebuilt and the walls rebuilt, and yet Israel drifted from God because they forgot this, that it was God who was the one that chose them. If we had time, we could go to Ephesians 1. Maybe you can do this in your small groups, 3 through 14, but you just see it laid out so clearly again by the Apostle Paul that it was God who from before the foundations of the earth chose us, that he predestined us for adoption as sons according to the purpose of his will, who works all things according to the purpose of his will. It's, it's the language of this is just abundantly clear when we see it. And so what should that do with us? Well, first, it should keep us humble. It should keep us humble as we realize and recognize and confess that God chose me long before I chose him. That God chose me before I had done anything praiseworthy. That God chose me knowing that I would rebel against him should keep me humble as I remember those things it should also keep me thankful to the Lord these doctrines that we're so familiar with they should never become so commonplace that we neglect to give thanks to God for the the glories of our salvation for the good news of the gospel Daily remembering God's sovereign election of us should prompt this gratefulness that expresses itself in prayer and praise to the Lord It should also keep us faithful. As we understand the affection that God showed us, it should anchor us to him as his faithful and loyal subjects. We remember the cost of what it it was to the Lord in order to redeem us, in order to ransom us, in order to, to make us his own. It should endear us to him from this point forward. It should also keep us from just going through the motions It should remind us that we need to be intentional about our relationship with the Lord in every facet of our relationship of the Lord. The other day I was on the the bike riding, getting ready for a ride and I looked at my son and I said, hey, can you bring me a a bottle of water? And he came back and he didn't just come back with a bottle of water, but he came back with this little energy stuff that we put in it sometimes and he, he gave it to me. And it was just one of those moments that he went above and beyond and it wasn't just going through the motions. And it's not that he, I expected him to grumble and complain, but it was so much even better for him to do that than if he had just gone and filled up a water bottle and brought it back and said, here, dad, here you go. He was demonstrating a love for me and an affection for me by going above and beyond and even thinking, okay, how can I serve you even more out of a, a, a demonstration of how much I, I love you? That's not going through the motions. And when we think of how much God has loved us, we should respond similarly to him. It should make us purposeful in our worship as we sing songs of praise to him, as we show up at church on Sunday mornings or Saturday nights, we need to do so with great purpose behind what we're doing, understanding that we are convening together as the body of Christ, coming into the presence of God together as his bride in order to sing songs of praise and thanksgiving to him. And this is part of what went wrong with Israel, is their drift, they had forgotten that God is the one that had chose them. And they grew into this sense of comfort and entitlement, thinking that they were in the clear now that Assyria was gone and Babylon was gone and the temple was rebuilt. Well, what did that actually look like? It begins with the failure of the priests in chapter one, verse six through chapter two, verse nine. The failure of the priests here, it it begins with them bringing polluted and defiled offerings into the temple. God wanted food that was pure and undefiled to be offered if it was going to be offered. He wanted animals that were what? Without blemish to be offered. And the Israelites and the, and the priests in particular, because that's where the buck stops with the people is with the spiritual leadership. They were allowing people to bring into the temple the, the animals who had a broken leg or the animals who were sick or the animals who had other blemishes or, or wrong things about them. And the priests were saying, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead and bring, bring your, your animal that you're looking to get rid of anyways. Bring that offering that's not going to cost you anything. That's easy for you to bring into the temple. Bring that. We'll offer that for you. It's no big deal. God won't care. Or they were taking food that was either unclean food or some other way it had been polluted. It was bought in a marketplace where they didn't know the origins of it. Whatever it may have been that that the priests were saying, yes, bring that in. We'll offer that. No problem. 
And what was happening is the people weren't fearing God. They weren't taking things seriously. And so they were looking to get by. They were looking to worship God with as little cost to them as they possibly could incur. And the priests were allowing it. This was worship with a distracted heart, with a hypocritical life, with flippant attitudes. It was also a failure of God's people to live like God's people. Look at verses 11 through 14. It says, for the rising of the sun to the setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations. There's that word nations twice there in verse 11. Notice the contrast. But you, Israel, my people, the people I formed, the people I loved, the people I've chosen, the people that I set my affections on, not Esau, you Israel, you profane my name. When you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is its food may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it. In other words, you think, what's the big deal? Says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick. And this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept this from your hand? Says the Lord. Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. So again, God's people are not acting like God's people. They're acting worse than the nations in the future will act. And God is calling Israel out on it, saying you are not fulfilling your identity as my people. Remember, I chose you out of love for you, and this is how you repay me. It was also a failure of God's priest to provide faithful instruction. Chapter two. What we see here is we see that the priests begin to, to pervert the instruction. And what we see is the ultimate in, indictment comes down in verse uh, eight and nine. It says, you have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, you do not instruct in my ways, but you show partiality in your instruction. We talked about this a little bit last week with Micah, that the priests were taking a bribe, that they were preaching good things to the people who would pay them. They were preaching to fill the audience, so to speak. And in, in some ways, we have a, a similar thing going on here, that the priests are not just preaching the clear, true, cut it straight word of God, but they're preaching with a partiality to those that are in the audience and those that are listening. And God's saying, this is unacceptable. But notice he contrasted earlier, right before this in chapter two. My covenant, verse five, he's speaking of Levi, my covenant with Levi, verse four, may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear. He feared me. So he's contrasting. He's saying, this is the way it should be. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. No wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and in uprightness. He turned many from iniquity for the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. It's thought and in, in by most that this is a reference not to Levi, the, the, the person, but to a descendant of Levi named Phineas. Do y'all remember the story of Phineas? From Numbers chapter 25, he saw an Israelite bring back a foreign woman and take her into his, his tent. And he walked into the tent after them with a spear in his hand and he pinned the two of them to the ground with the spear through both of them. And God commended him. And afterwards, God, it says in the text in Numbers 25, made a covenant with him that would never be broken. And so God is saying how far the priesthood has drifted from what it once was under men who were zealous for my righteousness and my glory like Phineas to now what it is with men who preach what is not true and show partiality to the masses. And so there was a failure of God's priest to provide faithful instruction. And so again, overall, they're the, the, the failures of the priests. But then we also see that the faithfulness, or the, excuse me, the faithlessness of the people. Not just the failures of the, of the priests, but the faithlessness of, of everyone, of all the people. And verse 10, it says, have we all not one father? Has not one God created us? 
Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves. How? Because he's married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And so the faithlessness of the people is seen in their intermarriage. And this goes back to the the profaning the covenant of God. And why is that profaning the covenant of God? Because when God struck the covenant with the people of Israel, what did he command them about intermarriage? He said, don't do it. Why? Because intermarriage leads to idolatry. Because when you marry the the foreign wives, you're going to embrace their foreign gods. And that's what the Israelites were beginning to do. Though we don't see any strict indictments of idolatry specifically in the text, we know that that was a natural outcome of intermarriage in the past when that had taken place. And so God is saying, you've been brought back to Jerusalem. The temple has been rebuilt. The, the walls are being rebuilt as, uh, as, as Malachi is prophesying this. And he's looking at Israel going, what are you doing intermarrying with the foreign peoples? It's profaning the covenant. And God pulls no punches in verse 12. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob, any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the house of the Lord of hosts. So basically what God has said here is, you're marrying foreign women, I'm divorcing you, is what the Lord says to those that have committed this. He's cutting himself off from them. The faithlessness of the people in intermarriage. Look at verse 13. Another consequence. In this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why don't you? And so in other words, God is saying, you have the boldness after you've intermarried, after you've profaned my covenant, after you've disobeyed my strict commands, then you come into my temple and you cover my altar with tears and weeping because I'm not responding to you and you play dumb and innocent like, well, why wouldn't God respond to me? After all, we're the people of Israel. He's shown us favor. He's brought us back to Jerusalem. God, what's wrong? And it's just the the brazenness and the hypocrisy of the people. But their faithlessness, faithlessness gets even worse In verse 14, but you say, why does he not? The Lord answers, because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. In other words, God wanted to perpetuate the the, the people of God through godly marriages, Israelite to Israelite. So he says, guard yourselves. Those of you who haven't done this, guard yourselves in the spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. The faithlessness of Israel reaches its culmination and its climax in this book with the divorce And what was happening here is the Israelites were divorcing their Israelite wives to go and marry foreign women. So this is the the, the profaning of the covenant even unpacked even further for us. And why God is so angry with the people. And in fact, this is parallel to their relationship with God. They had divorced God in order to go and join themselves to foreign women and their gods as well. Let me just touch on verse 16. It's a difficult verse in the Hebrew. You may be looking at a different translation if you don't have the ESV. A lot of other translations starts out with God hates divorce. It's a possible rendering of it. The ESV chose to render it this way for the man who does not love his wife but divorces her. That that does not love his wife and, and the hatred that comes through in, in other translations, it's, a, it's an editorial decision that was made. I think it's an okay editorial decision that's made. I don't think this needs to shake you to your core of, of your faith. What this communicates, whether your translation says God hates divorce or the man who does this covers his garment with violence, it communicates that what? God is not happy. 
God hates divorce, that this is not okay, that this is not a good thing. And so he's confronting the faithlessness of the people, the, the, the failure of the priest, the faithlessness of the people, and then also just the, the fallenness of the people. The rest of chapter two into chapter three, in verse 17, you've wearied the Lord with your words. Again, he anticipates their objection, but you say, how have we wearied him? God responds by saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them or by asking, where is the God of justice? In other words, the people were looking around and much like uh, the, the Job and, and others were saying, well, why do the wicked prosper, right? They were looking around going, hey, those who do evil, God must approve of them because they're not being smit with lightning bolts. That's not a word. They're not being struck off the face of the earth uh, with, with God's vengeance and fury right away. They're allowed to continue to prosper and live. What's the, what are we to do with that? And they're crying out, where is justice? All the while, remind you that they are committing what? Acts of injustice themselves, there's irony here that the people who are so unjust want God to respond in justice and really know they don't because God responds to them and he says, behold, anytime God says behold when he's angry, it's not a good thing for the people who are supposed to behold. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Who's he talking about here? John the Baptist, right? This verse is quoted when John the Baptist comes on the scene. John the Baptist, he, the voice of one declaring, prepare the way of the Lord. And the Lord whom you seek, the one you want justice from, Israel, Judah, will come suddenly to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver he will purify the sons of Levi, those corrupt priests, and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. Then I will draw near to you in judgment. For I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages. Here's the, the social justice that's not being done. The widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. In, in, in other words, that justice that you're longing for, Judah, that you're looking around going, well, obviously the Lord doesn't care about evil and wickedness because look, evil, the evil and wicked, they're, they're prospering. He says... Not so fast. Judgment is going to come. And it's going to come against all of you. The fallenness of Israel. It's not a pretty picture there with all of the sins that I just listed off. The sorcerers, adulterers, those who oppress, the widow and the fatherless. But beyond that, they were also robbing the Lord. Verse six, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Notice the, the little flash of God's mercy that we see in the midst of all this judgment. I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, from the, says the Lord of hosts. So God's saying, okay, Malachi, let's not let them lose sight of what the purpose in all of this is. The purpose in all of this is still their restoration. You know, in, in a lot of ways, the minor prophets are just like glimpses of church discipline being carried out against the entire nation of Israel. Because the, the purpose of church discipline every time, all the time, including even to, the, to its full carrying out of putting the person out of fellowship, is to get that person to be restored to the Lord. So God is instructing Malachi, okay, in the midst of this Malachi, the, the fire and brimstone, remind them of my mercy. I'm a God who does not change. You're still here. I haven't wiped you out. In other words, there's still time. What do we need to do? God, you need to return to me and I will return to you. There's that hope that he throws out there. But then there's Israel. How shall we return? They're not asking for a step-by-step -step process here. They're saying, how is it that you can ask us to return? Is what they're saying. Why should we return? Return from what? 
In other words, there, there's a, they're, they're missing it still. And so the Lord says, okay, well, let me turn to something else that I've got against you. Verse eight, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? And your tithes and your contributions, you're cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Again, an, an offer of mercy here. Correct it. How? Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Oh, the prosperity preachers love that verse. But God was promising that to the Israelites, to the, to the inhabitants of Judah. He's like, look, bring your tithes and see if I won't respond in faithfulness to you. Again, his mercy. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for you. That must have been the, the, the locust or some other insect that was plaguing their crops, that was causing famine in the land. I will rebuke the devourer for you, which was, by the way, a curse for disobedience back in Deuteronomy chapter 28, so that it will not destroy the first fruits of your soil, the fruits of your soil, your vine in the field. Verse 13, your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. And again, the stubbornness of the people. But you say, how have we spoken out against you? God says, you have said it's vain, it's pointless, it's futile to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. And so in other words, they're saying, what's the point of even following you, Lord? That's how you've spoken out against me, says God. But in chapter four, God's justice is coming. For behold, the day is coming. I know I skipped over verse 16. I'll come back to that in a second. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming that shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will not leave them root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall and you shall tread down the wicked for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. This is God's major indictment. We saw his electing love to begin with in the second point tonight. We need to avoid the dangers of nominal faith because that's what Israel had. Avoid the dangers of nominal faith. This is Christianity without conviction. Easy believism. This is speaking of the prosperity preachers. This is what they make their living by. There's no focus or desire for holiness. This is also religion without substance. Not just without conviction, but it's religion without substance. It's empty. It's, it's pointless. When you push back from the, the table at the end of the day or from the desk at work and you think about your unbelieving friends and you look at their life, you begin to think, man, they've got it so good. What am I even doing? Why am I even doing this? Why am I following the Lord? What is, what is it benefiting me is the mindset. It's going through the motions. There's no relationship there with the Lord. You feel no intimacy with God at all. There's no weight or meaning. There's no affection for God. Time in the word is non-existent, dry, wearisome. Prayer is stale, distant, inconsistent, if it's there even at all. There's no confidence in the Lord. Anxieties creep in with ease and, and overtake you regularly. Your emotions are stirred up easily and anger ensues at the drop of a hat. Depression is a close companion. These are all symptoms that can indicate that your faith is nominal faith. I'm not saying that this means that if you've struggled with this or felt this way that you're not a Christian. There are seasons that we'll go through. But I will say if you look at all of those things that I was just talking about and saying, man, that defines me to a T and it's defined me for the last, as long as I can remember. 
then there may be a, a, a very real danger that you are professing what is just an empty and nominal faith in Christ. How do we guard against this? What do we do to combat this? How can I tell, is this me? Paul says, number one, examine yourself, right? 2 Corinthians 13.5. 2 Corinthians 13.5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. He's writing this to believers. To the church in Corinth. Yes, they had their issues and massive issues at that. But yet at the same time, he's writing to people saying, check yourself to make sure that you're in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Peter picks this theme up in 2 Peter 1, 10 through 11. 2 Peter 1, 10 through 11. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. And I would encourage you to go back and, and read prior to this. From, I, I believe it's about four through verse nine. And he's listing these, these attributes, these qualities that should mark the person who is a follower of God. And Peter's saying, look, you want to confirm your calling and election? Take that list and hold it up to your life and see how you're doing with those things. And he says, for in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Am I preaching works salvation? No, I'm preaching salvation that works. And there's a reason why in the New Testament, especially the, the Lord provides for us under the inspiration of the writers, lists of what we should be doing. It's so that we can take spiritual inventory of our lives to hold them up and to say, okay, God, I, I want to make sure that I'm not like the people of Malachi, that I'm, I'm not just comfortable in my nominal Christianity, but that I'm actually following you. So examine yourself. Also, another thing that you can do is remind yourself daily of the rewards for faithfulness. To combat the temptation, because guys, I'll, I, I will tell you straightforward, nominal Christianity is far easier than biblical Christianity. It will be far easier for, this, for you in this world for you to skate by with a nominal profession of Christ. The problem is you will not be able to skate into eternity with a nominal profession of faith in Christ. So remind yourself daily of the rewards for faithfulness that make it worth it. Prioritize time in the word. Prioritize time in prayer. I hope, guys, I, I hope if, if I'm ever not behind this pulpit, you guys remember me and go, that guy continued to just hammer on reading the Bible and praying. I will have considered my, my job done at that point. But this also just takes discipline. Discipline. It is a real danger, and it's a real danger in the New Testament as well. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23 addresses that, right? When Jesus says that on that day, there will be many who come to me and say, Lord, Lord, we're part of your people, didn't we? And they're going to list all the things that they did. And he's going to say, depart from me, for I never knew you. You profess to know me. I don't know you. Make sure that you not only know Christ, but Christ knows you. As we just talked about. Well, our last point will be a little bit more speedy than those. Because in spite of all of this, the faithfulness, faithlessness of his people, God still, as we've already mentioned briefly, but as we'll look at even more so here, he still leaves the door open for repentance before the end. Look at verse four of chapter four. Remember the law of my servant Moses. When he says remember there, it's not just call it to mind, but it's a word that meant to call it to mind and carry it out. Remember and do it. Return to being faithfully obedient to the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb, that was when the, the law was delivered for all Israel. Verse five, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. God is so gracious. He's leaving the window for repentance and return wide open to the Israelites. Elijah the prophet, is that John the Baptist? Yes, because Jesus says so, right? He says, he says, Elijah has come. He says, it was, if, if you're willing to accept it. So for those that 
repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ now, Elijah has come. It's John the Baptist, okay? But there's also a no to that as well, right? Because the, the people went to John the Baptist and they said, hey, are you Elijah the prophet? And what did John say? No, ha, huh, you silly Christians, your Bible contradicts itself. Nah, not really. Because this prophecy is given to who? Not the church, but the Jews, to Israel, who rejected Jesus. We talked about this last week a little bit with Micah chapter five, verse two, the ruler to be born in Bethlehem. So there's still an, uh, an Elijah that's gonna come in the future before the great and awesome day of the Lord. When is that talked about? Rhymes with Shmevelation and starts with an R. The book of Revelation, one of the two witnesses will be Elijah the prophet before the ultimate final day of judgment. And that witness is going to be calling on the Jews to do what? Repent. And so God is saying he's going to live, leave the, the window open, the door open for them to return in faithfulness to him. In fact, Zechariah in a beautiful text talks about how he's going to open up a, a, a fountain of blood for the forgiveness of their sins. As they turn and they put their trust in the one up in, in whom they had, had pierced, as they look upon the one whom they have pierced, and they mourn and they weep, and that mourning and weeping turns into joy as they put their faith in Jesus. That is coming. That is available. That is held out. Verse 16, then those who fear the Lord spoke with one another. This is chapter three. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of all those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I take up or make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. As we wrap up together tonight, guys, it's this final point. Fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. And you're saying, man, that sounds familiar. It does sound familiar. Because there was a, a wise man named Solomon who after he had realized what all of life looks like in light of the inescapability and unavoidability of death comes to this conclusion and says, the thing that's going to get you where you ultimately want to be, it's not possessions. It's not women. It's not your work. It's not what you're going to leave behind to others. It's this, fear God and keep his commandments. And so as Micah is the prophet speaking into this time when those of, of his people were acting so wickedly and rebelling against God and forgetting all of God's goodness. And he was looking at a time when it should have been Israel just in, in glory with the temple rebuilt. And he's looking around seeing just abject despair around him because everything had been so perverted. He holds out this promise from the Lord and says, hey, look, you know what? If you will fear God, your name will be written in the book of remembrance that book on that final day that will be opened up and those that are in that book will enter into eternity with the Lord. You will be spared from that judgment. And so that's the promise that he holds out to them. It's the promise that I want us to see as well. There's a danger for us that Malachi holds out to us and calls us to remember that we can drift into a state of spiritual complacency just like the Israelites can. We can begin to go through the motions just like the Israelites can. We can begin to feel that, that spiritual apath apathy just like the Israelites did. And so as Malachi wrote this book to awaken his people from the state of spiritual slumber, it's a good wake-up call for us as well to make sure that we have not fallen asleep in our walks with Christ. And for those that haven't, like Micah and Jonah and Joel and Nahum and Habakkuk, let's be like Malachi in this world. And go out and warn and go out and plead and go out and call people to faith in Christ. To fear God and keep his commandments. And the way that that starts for anyone is to keep that first commandment. Repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. God, we are thankful for this book. God, I'm thankful for that the 400 years of silence ended. With John the Baptist coming to prepare the way for the Lord. And that you sent Christ for us to die on the cross for our sins, God. And there's not a man in this room who hasn't gone through the motions at least one time or another over the course of his walk with you. There's not a, a man in this room who hasn't drifted into a state of, of spiritual apathy from time to time. And God, we confess that before you tonight and ask for your forgiveness. Lord, you are so kind and patient with us. And we thank you for that. 
Lord, I'm reminded of what you told Peter that you are not slow as we would count slowness, but you are patient towards all mankind, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And so Lord, let us go with that message and that urgency saying, while the window is open for the lost in this world to come back to Christ, to repent from their sins and put their faith in Jesus as their savior, God, use us as those instruments. Romans 10, how are they going to hear unless someone preaches? God, send out preachers from this room to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that lost may be saved for your glory, so that more names may be added to that book of remembrance, that book of life, God. Do that for your glory until Christ returns. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.